uh, good evening students today we will be studying the chapter evolution in evolution we will be studying about theories of the evolution of life evidences of evolution theories of evolution then a brief account of evolution and human evolution every concept will be dealt in so, evolution the definition means an orderly change from one form to another remember that it's an orderly change from one form to another so what is evolutionary biology evolutionary biology is the study of history of life forms on earth study of history of life forms on earth so remember first we'll study about origin of life so if you have to study the origin of life first we should know how the earth originated so earth originated because of a big bang that took place about 20 billion years ago remember this 20 billion years ago by a thermonuclear explosion which is called as the big bang of a so the earth was formed about 4.5 billion years ago and there was no atmosphere on the earth and and it had just it had just water vapor methane carbon dioxide and ammonia which were released from molten mass covered the surface which was released from the molten mass which covered the surface so three major reactions took place here water because of the presence of uv rays disassociated into hydrogen and oxygen ammonia plus water gave rise to ammonia plus oxygen gave rise to water methane plus oxygen gave rise to carbon dioxide then the ozone layer was formed ozone means o3 ozone layer was formed then as the earth cooled the water vapor fell as rain to fill all the depression and form the ocean so all the depressions that were there were filled with water this formed the oceans then there were various theories for the origin of life these are the few theories we will go one by one we will start with theory of abiogenesis or theory of spontaneous generation. It states that life came out of decaying and decaying and rotting matter that is organic matter like straw, mud etc. This is not an acceptable theory. Then Louis Pasteur demonstrated that life came from pre-existing life and disproved abiogenesis theory. So he took up two sterile flasks, two sterile flasks and he killed the yeast that was there in one flask. Okay. And both the flasks and he kept the other flask open to air so that new organisms arose from it. So this did not have any growth whereas this one had growth. This proved that life did not come spontaneously. Then we have the theory of biogenesis. It states that life originates from pre-existing life life originates from pre-existing life this theory was proposed by francisco reddy spallanzani and louis pasteur so this theory proposed that life came from pre-existing life that means one organism give, gives birth to an other other offspring go to the next one Cosmic theory or theory of panspermia. The theory of panspermia states that states that units of life, that is spores, were transferred to different planets, including Earth. That means unit of life came from some other planet and they landed on Earth. Then we have theory of special creation. It states that everything was created by some supernatural power that is the God. Then, theory of chemical evolution. So, it was proposed by Oparin and Halden. It states that first form of life was originated from pre-existing, non-living or inorganic and organic molecules like methane, ammonia, water, proteins, nucleic acids, etc. Nucleic acids, etc so they came from non-living inorganic and organic matter so please remember that they came from non-living organic and inorganic 
matter. Then, that is abiogenesis first, but biogenesis ever since. So, the first life came from abiogenesis, but after that, it was biogenesis. One organism would give birth to another offspring. So, to prove all this, there was a famous experiment done by Urey and Miller. So, Harold Urey and Stanley Miller and Stanley Miller, they conducted an experiment to prove the theory of chemical evolution, to prove the theory of chemical evolution. They created a similar condition of the primitive earth, of the primitive earth, that is high temperature, volcanic storms, reducing the atmosphere, containing <coughs> methane, ammonia, water vapor and hydrogen. So, please look at the <coughs> experimental setup. Then, what did it? This is a, this is the setup of Uri Miller's experiment. What they made? They made an electric discharge in a closed flask. So, this glass flask here contained methane, ammonia, hydrogen and even water vapor and even water vapor. And they had two electrodes which produced sparks which were very similar to that of lightning that occurred in the atmosphere. So, after this, the water was condensed, passed through the trap and again boiled and recirculated and again boiled and recirculated. So, understand this, this experiment was set up for a few weeks. Some of them, some of them observed sugar, nitrogen bases, pigments and fats in the sample here. So, this proves that life originated in water, life originated in water. This is the setup of Uri and Miller. So, understand this. The first non cellular form of life originated 3 billion years ago. They were RNA proteins and polysaccharides. They were RNA proteins and polysaccharides. Understand this. So, if you are telling that evidence that evolution has taken place, then what is the evidence for evolution? So, we have different evidences for evolution. One of the most accepted one is the paleontological evidence, that is the fossils. Then morphological and anatomical evidence about homologous and analogous organs. Biochemical evidences about the chemicals that are produced and also about the genes. Then evidences from evolution by natural selection. These four are taken into consideration as evidences for evolution. Let us go one by one. Paleontology. Paleontology is the study of fossils. Study of fossils. So, what are fossils? It is study of fossils. What are fossils? Fossils are remains of hard parts of life forms found in rocks in the earth crust. What type of rocks are they? So, they are the elementary rocks. Okay. So, fossils are written documents or evolution. So, from fossils, we will be able to tell what type of organism survived, what did they feed on, what did they feed on and how they have evolved into the new forms. How they have evolved into the new forms. This is very, very important. This is very important. So, what is the significance? Look at this. The study of phylogeny, that is the evolutionary history or race history of horse evolution. So, if you look at this diagram here, if you look at the picture here, so what does it show? It shows you modern horse, modern horse with the one which is here. This is the modern horse. So, we have got different fossils here. Look at this, 1 million years ago, that is almost 10 lakh years ago, we had a horse. But 10 million years ago, if you go, okay, look at this, we have Pleohippus. 30 million years ago, it looked like this. 40 million years ago it is like this, 60 million years ago it is like this. So, from here to here, so how they have evolved. So, there is a connection in their foot. Can you see here? So, they have moved from here to here to here. So, this is important. Okay. Then, fossil indicates the connecting link between two groups of organisms. So, what are connecting links? They will have characters of 
two major groups of organisms. Okay, so this is Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx. Can you see? It has a beak like a bird. It has a beak like a bird. It has teeth. It has teeth just like reptiles. It has claws like reptiles. It has a tail like reptiles, but it has feathers. But it has feathers. Okay, remember this. But it has feathers. So one second, one second. So they give an idea of form and structure of extinct animals. Example, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are extinct reptiles. So remember this. So they will have many characters. So this is a picture that was that is there in your textbook. So these are all reptiles. Now these reptiles have the, now these reptiles have evolved into birds also. Can you see here? It's an archaeopteryx here. It is a connecting link. It is a connecting link. It is a connecting link. So now, fossils are found in the sedimentary layers. Do you remember I told you sedimentary rocks? Sedimentary rocks? No. Here, sedimentary layers which indicate the geological period. This shows that life forms varied over time. So as you are coming down in the soil, as you are coming down in the soil, you are actually going back in time. So as you are going down, you are going back in time. So some life forms are restricted to certain geological time span. That means those type of organisms are only found in certain geological time span. They are not found anywhere else. So remember this. This is very important. Okay, so we'll stop here. We'll see the second part. Morphological and anatomical evidences. So comparative anatomy and morphology show that different animals have, have some common so different animals have some common structural features. So even though they belong to distinct groups, so they are not anywhere related, they are not closely related at all, but they are still having common structural features. So what are they? What are they? Listen. Homologous organs, okay? Homologous organs. What are homologous organs? The organs which are fundamentally similar in structure and origin. So the organs which are fundamentally similar in structure and origin, okay, but adapted for different functions. So same structure, same origin, but different function. This phenomena is called as homology and the organs are called as homologous organs. Okay, now here, morphological and anatomical evidences. So, <laughs> We'll go with we'll go one by one. Example, example, whale's flipper, bat's wing, cheetah's foot, and human hand. So you'll be thinking, sir, they're all different, but they are all mammals. Remember this whale, bat, cheetah, and human. All of them are mammals. They are all mammals. And they have a common structure. Can you see here? All of them have humerus, 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 humerus. Ulna and radius, ulna and radius, ulna and radius, ulna and radius. Carpals, 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 and carpals. Metacarpals, 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 metacarpals. Phalanges, 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 phalanges. Exactly the same. Slight differences there. Okay. So all of them, all of them here are mammals. So they have a common origin. They have a common origin. And structure is also same. So what do they have? They have humerus, ulna and radius, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So just keep it in short form. So humerus, ulna radius, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So they have the same structure also.
So all these will perform different function but are constructed on the same plan. So the, the forelimb of man, the hand of man, the function is different. Whereas the cheetah, forelimb is only for running and catching the prey. In whale, flipper, it will help, it will help in movement, swimming. Whereas in bat, it will help in flying. So the structure is same, origin is same, but the function is different. So all these perform different functions, but are constructed on the same plan, but are constructed on the same plan. Understand this. Homology can be seen in skeleton. So here, radius, sorry, humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals and phalanges. So look at this heart, blood vessels, excretory system, brain, etc. So this is very, very important homology. So you have to study the examples also. Now, morphological and anatomical evidences, homology we can see in plants also, fawns and tendrils, bougainvillea and cucurbita. See what is the characteristic feature? So both of them originate from the same axillary body. Okay, fawn and bougainvillea. Okay, and tendrils and cucurbita. But their function is different. Origin is different, structure is same, but the function is different. Then the origin of homologous organs is due to adaptations to different needs and is called divergent evolution. So understand this, even though they are related, they are adapted to different needs and is called divergent evolution and is called divergent evolution. Whereas homology, it indicates a common ancestry. Whereas homology, it indicates a common ancestry. So remember that all of them here, we took the example of mammals. Then divergent evolution is a process by which the related species become less similar in order to survive in different environmental conditions. So remember this, divergent evolution is a process by which the related species become less similar in order to survive in different environmental conditions. So, then we go to the next part, that is analogous organs. Analogous organs is different from homologous organs. What is it? Analogous organs are having similar function, but different structure and origin, but different structure and origin. This phenomena is called analogy. This phenomena is called analogy. Example, wings of insects and wings of birds. Both of them have the same function of flying. But, but remember, wing of insect is made out of cutting, which is a polysaccharide. Whereas wings of birds, they are basically four limbs. They are four limbs which are modified into wings. Then eye of octopus and mammals. So retina is from skin, whereas mammals it is from embryonic origin. So their origin is different, but their function is the same. Flipper of penguin and dolphin. Their origin is different. Why? One is a bird, the other one is a mammal, but their function is the same. Then sweet potato. Root modification, stem modification. Both of them, the function is the same, but their origin is different. Why sweet, sweet potato is root modification and normal potato is stem modification. Then, trachea of insects from ectoderm, whereas lung of vertebrates is from endoderm. So, remember this, it's very important. It's very important. Morphological and anatomical evidence says the origin of analogous organs due to adaptations for life in similar habitats is called convergent evolution. There it was divergent evolution. So here due to adaptation for life of similar habitats where whereas it was for different habitats. So remember this. Then convergent evolution is the process by which unrelated species become more similar in order to survive in similar environmental conditions. Understand this? Convergent evolution is a process by which unrelated species become more similar in order to survive in similar environmental conditions. Remember that. That is the convergent evolution. Okay? Then, we go to the next one. Biochemical evidence. What are biochemical evidences? It is similarities in proteins and in genes. The similarities in proteins and in genes. 
the similarities in other in other biomolecules and metabolism in other biomolecules and metabolism this is very very important so we would have studied about uh, dna fingerprinting in molecular basis of inheritance in molecular basis of inheritance we know about it how similarities are seen between two individuals and two groups of organisms evidences for evolution by natural selection so this is also very important natural selection is a process by which organisms that are best suited for their environmental survival okay suited for their environment survive and reproduce so remember this that are best suited so remember that for the environment and survive and reproduce remember this this is very important they survive and they reproduce they survive and they reproduce okay now we'll go to the next part so there is a classical example that has been given in your syllabus for natural selection so in england before industrialization that is before 1850s there were more white things than moths on trees than dark winged moths okay or melanized moths so in a dark bathroom the white winged moths are easily visible and are eaten up by predators whereas the dark winged moths are not seen whereas in a lighter bathroom the dark winged moths are easily seen and the white winged moths will increase in number whereas after industrialization in 1920 more dark winged moths and less light winged moths were seen so understand if it's a darker background can you see here there's a moth here in a darker background you can't easily see the darker moth whereas you can see the lighter moth which will be consumed by predators so now what happened next so reason before industrialization there was thick growth of white colored lichens which covered the trees okay white colored lichens which covered the trees in that bathroom white with the moths survived but dark colored moths were picked by predators so what is happening there is white colored lichen there is white colored lichen which can be easily seen which can be easily seen for birds but what is happening is but what is happening is the white colored moths were not seen why because there is a white bark whereas the dark colored moths could be seen whereas the dark colored moths could be seen so because of this reason because of this reason what happened all the dark moths were eaten up but but after industrialization let us see what happened after industrialization the tree trunks became dark due to industrial smoke and soot and there is no growth of lichens so we have studied in in, in environmental issues about lichens being the bio indicators for pollution lichens being the bio indicators for pollution so what is happening because there is lot of smoke the lichens are not surviving there under this condition white with moths did not survive because of predators easily identified them and the dark moths survived because suitable dark background was seen that is predators could not identify them so now can you see here this is the advantage so one in normal area the other one in dark area okay now we'll go to the next one natural selection by anthropogenic action so here we have used the word anthropogenic that is why human action so because of humans the reason is humans excess use of herbicides and pesticides etc resulted in selection of resistant varieties excess use of herbicides and pesticides etc resulted in selection of resistant varieties then excess use of antibiotics and drugs resulted in selection of resistant varieties this is very important so use of antibiotics and drugs resulted in selection of resistant varieties that is why that is why we come up with new and new types of antibiotics every now and then why because organisms will become resistant to it we we'll go to the next one biogeographical evidences 
So listen to this. The, for, the one classical example for it, the concept for it is adaptive radiation. A process of evolution of closely related species in a given geographical area starting from a point. So here, here, what does it say? A process of evolution of closely related species. So all of them are closely related species. In a geographical area starting from a point. So here, remember this. So there are some birds here which have transformed themselves into fruit eaters. Some of them are insect eaters, cactus eaters and seed eaters. Okay. So based on that, they have different types of beaks. So see here, they have all originated from a common point. There is one type of pitch here. Some of them became fruit eaters. If they have become fruit eaters, what type of beak should they have? They should have a parrot-like beak. Can you see here? That's a vegetarian tree finch. Then, if it is an insect eater, it should be able to catch insects. It should be able to catch, catch insects. And it should be able to go into the crevices. So, wherever small space is there, it should be able to go there. So, all of it here, there are tree finches. See here, there are tree finches. Why? Because they, have, they want to eat insects. Insects. So, understand this. Then, cactus eater, cactus eaters are there which can have both probing and sharp, pin, sharp beak, beaks. Whereas seed eaters, they have a very thick, stout beak. Why? They should have that because they should be able to crush the seeds and eat them. They are usually ground finches. So, if they are seed eaters, all the seeds that have been on the ground, they will be eaten up by seed eaters. Can you see the different types of beaks here? See here, different types of beak based on their food habit, based on their food habit. So remember this. Example, Darwin's finches, which are seen in Galapagos Islands. Darwin finches, which are seen in Galapagos Islands. Okay. And Australian marsupials, that are pouched mammals and placental mammals in Australia. So we'll look at them. Look at this. Placental mammals will have a same type of marsupial mammal also. So mole, anteater, mouse, lemur, flying squirrel, bobcat and wolf. Remember these names? These are important for meat. More than one adaptive radiation has appeared in an isolated geographical area. This leads to convergent evolution. So convergent evolution has taken place in Australia. Just have a look at it. Convergent evolution has taken place in Australia. Australia for marsupials and placental mammals. Let me see. These are the marsupial radiation. Just have a look. Just have a look at it, students. Now, can you see different types of marsupial? Now, marsupial rat, you know, banded anteater, tiger cat, Tasmanian wolf, sugar glider, marsupial mole, koala, bandicoot, wombat, kangaroo, all of these are marsupials. Okay. At the same time, for every marsupial, there is a placental mammal. For every placental mammal, there is a type of a marsupial. So, can you see here? Anteater has no bat. Which is also an anteater, but it's a marsupial. Mouse will have a marsupial mouse. Lemur, you have spotted cuscus. Flying squirrel, you have flying phalanger. Bobcat, you have Tasmanian tiger cat. Wolf, you have Tasmanian wolf. So remember this. This is very very important. So please have a look. Now, we will go to different theories of evolution that have been given by so, Now, we will go to different theories of evolution that have been given by different scientists. So, there are three major scientists that we study here. Theory of Lamarck. Okay. So, Lamarck is one very important scientist. More than Lamarck, we involve into Darwinian theory of evolution and mutation theory of evolution. Okay. Now, 
let us look at the Lemax theory. It states that evolution of life form occurred by use and disuse of organs. So remember this? It took place by use and disuse of organs. Use and dis disuse of organs. Okay. So what is the example for it? The example for it is giraffe. Giraffe. So let us look at it. Long neck of giraffe is due to continuous elongation to forage leaves on tall trees. So initially they were eating vegetation in the lower okay, then they elongated their neck. Then complete elongation took place. Okay. So their neck elongated to a very high range. Then this is an example for usage of organs. What about disuse? Total disappearance of limbs and snakes. The limb, the snake would almost move with their body itself. There was no requirement for limbs. And the limbs actually proved as a hindrance for movement. Okay. Then, such acquired characters inherited to the succeeding generation. Inherited to the succeeding generation. Okay. So, this theory was eliminated out because it proved that characters are inherited only through genes. Only through genes. So now we go to Darwinian theory of evolution. So by Charles Darwin, it is based on two key concepts. The first one is natural selection. Second one is branching descent. Natural selection is very important. So let us consider a bacterial colony A. So let us take a bacterial colony which is A. Okay, which is given in a which is a given medium. If the median composition is changed. Only a part of the population, say B, can survive under new condition. So what, what we do? If it is same medium, if it is same medium, then what will happen? This one will also be A. So if we take A and we change the medium, okay, and we change medium. Then what, what will happen? This will transform into the another type of bacteria which will survive under new condition and this variant population outgrows the others and will appear as a new species. Understand this? That means B is better than A under the new condition. So the nature will select for a fitness. So B is considered to be naturally fit. Naturally fit for survival and it has been selected by nature. So the work of Malthus on population was influenced, has influenced Darwin to a very great level. So natural selection is based on the following facts. Inheritable minor variation. Any minor variation seen in the parents that will be inherited by the offspring. Then overproduction of offspring. Every organism will try to produce maximum number of offspring in its fertile period. Then limited natural resources. Natural resources will obviously remain limited based on any other condition. So any other condition there, it will always be limited. It will not increase just because the population has increased. Then there is struggle for existence and only the fittest will survive. Okay. So read this. Population size grows faster if everybody reproduces maximally. Okay. But population sizes are limited due to computation for resources, due to computation for resources and struggle for existence only some survive and grow okay only some will survive and grow that is the survival of the fittest so what did darwin say darwin said that the organisms with better heritable variation example better resource utilization this is very important better resource utilization reproduce and leave more progenies what do you mean by progeny offspring so more the offspring, the better it is. So Darwin here is not talking about physical fitness. He is talking about reproductive fitness. He is talking about reproductive fitness. Remember that. He is talking about reproductive fitness. So it leads to a change in population of characteristics and a new form appear. And new forms appear. Then what is the mechanism for evolution? 
Yes, if revolution is taking place, there should be some mechanism. So for that, Hugo de Rice gave a theory and even Darwin had watched it. So Darwin ignored about the origin of variation and mechanism of speciation, whereas Hugo de Rice proposed the mutation theory of evolution. He conducted some experiment on Ibn Pimprimbrose, that is Enothera Lamarckia. Okay, so what were his observations? One second. So, Darwin, he said there are always minor variations which will bring about evolution. Whereas mutation theory, he said that there are large variations. Darwin said it is directional. That means if there is a particular path in which evolution has to take place, it will always grow, grow in the same path. It will not change at all. Whereas mutation, he said it is random, random, sudden and directionless. So we don't know what is happening. It just happens and the nature goes with it. That is what he says. Whereas Darwin says it is gradual evolution. Whereas in Hugo de Rice, in mutation he says it is speciation by saltation. It is speciation by saltation. That is a single step large mutation. Remember this? This is an important definition. What is saltation? It is single step large mutation. Single step large mutation. So remember this? 